Find your future by exploring your world. The Massachusetts School of Law challenges their students to explore the important issues of our time, learning from experts in fields like politics, sports, and business law. From firsthand accounts and dramatic reenactments, in-depth conversations with society's leaders, from historians to lawyers, from high-tech professionals to environmental experts. The Massachusetts School of Law at Andover presents MSLaw.edu. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. The topic for today's show is American Women in Combat, as written about in Kirsten Homestead's book, Band of Sisters. This book addresses a very important social issue, American women on the front lines in combat in Iraq. What are their experiences? What are their stories? Why don't we hear about them? Are female soldiers like their male counterparts? What about the children left at home? Joining me is the author of Band of Sisters, Kirsten Holmstead. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Just a terrific book. Thank you for coming. Also joining me is the military's first black female combat pilot, Marine Captain Bernice Armour. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You're very impressive. <laughs> and also joining me is Gunnery Sergeant Rosie Knoll. Welcome. You've done some marvelous things. I'm very impressed. And I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. Kirsten, let me start with you. How is it that you became involved in this book, in the project that you were following the war so very closely that you ultimately write this great book? Sure. I was working on a master's in fine arts degree in um, a, a university down in North Carolina and I live right near Camp Lejeune, the Marine Corps base there. And when the war started, I had to come up, I was working on a, my thesis, I had to start my thesis and I was seeing all these women deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan and I was wondering how they were going to do over there. I felt like this was a big experiment that was going to play out on the battlefield and I really wanted to watch it closely. I think. First of all, I was hearing about the debate and about women in combat when they were actually going over there, and I just felt like it was crazy to debate this when they were actually there doing a job. And, and being a woman, I was empathizing and relating to these women and kind of wanted to put myself in their boots and, and uh, see what they were going through and, and how they were doing. So, I, so when they started coming back, I, I began interviewing them and finding out about their experiences. Also, when, when the war started, you'd hear sound bites on TV and radio and uh, in the newspaper, short articles about the women, but I was never fulfilled with those stories. I always wanted to learn more about them, and writing this book gave me that opportunity. How is it that Americans have always believed and still believe today that war and combat are associated exclusively with men. Yet women, like our two guests here, are actually very involved in combat in Iraq and have been in other wars. Well, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with chivalry and society and how we're raised. Uh, and men, men are just used to, you know, cowboys and Indians and guns and G.I. Joe and it's just, it's a whole societal thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, women, women are in the boardroom, they're in the operating room, they're on the soccer fields now, they're everywhere and now they're on the battlefield. And it's just a uh, society catching up to other societies because there are other societies that allow women in combat and in their military. We're not the first. Before we talk with our two Marines, one final question. For the audience, give us some idea of the scope of women's involvement in the war in Iraq. Sure. Well, my story tells some of their stories. My book does. Um, but we have women who are in firefights. We have women who are driving in convoys, driving trucks. They're logisticians. They're MPs. A lot of female MPs have been killed in Iraq. Um, they're in military aviation for the first time in history in this war. Um, nurses, there have always been nurses, but all the medical staff now, there are women in all the medical staff. But they're all over the battlefield. How many women have served in Iraq? Um, well, women, female service members have served more than 167,000 tours of duty since the global war on terrorism began in 2002. Wow. That's an yeah, amazing number. It is an amazing number, and it's Surprising to me, I simply don't read or hear about mm -hmm. that. Have many women been killed and wounded? More than 80 have been killed and another 500 have been, or more than 500 have been wounded. 
Tell me, how does a young girl growing up in Tennessee end up in the cockpit of a Cobra helicopter? Tell me your story. <laughs> well, actually, since the age of about three or four, I wanted to be a police officer that rode a horse downtown. Well, when I got to college, I was putting myself through and didn't have that much money. So one of the flyers in the student union building really caught my attention. It said, free trip to Mardi Gras. It's like, free trip? That's great. Now, notice it didn't say vacation because you had to do something. You had to join the female rifle team with the ROTC program. And I did that, and it was just a great bond, great camaraderie. And my stepdad was a Marine. My grandfather was a Marine, and my dad was a retired major in the Army. So I said, hey, I got this military thing. I can do that. And I also thought it, thought it would help me in my endeavors to become that police officer. So I joined, immensely uh, liked it. When I came back, I got involved in the ROTC program. Well, that next summer, I uh, saw a black female in a flight suit, and I just, whoa. And it planted that seed when I saw that image, and I decided I wanted to be a female aviator. What does it take for a woman to be a Cobra pilot? Uh, tenacity, ambition, uh, hard work is basically what it boils down to, and the desire to do it. When you were in the cockpit in Iraq, Every day when you came home and landed, did you say, thank God I made it through another day, or were you not really that afraid? Well, I'm deeply spiritual anyway, so I always th say thank God for everything. Uh, he's just the reason for me being here and my being. But did I say it specifically for not dying out on the battlefield? No, not necessarily. I was out there doing a job just like all the other Marines that were there with me and those that are there now doing that same job. So fear didn't really come into it. It was... I was there to do a job. I was preparing to do the job the next day. So you really didn't have that mental downtime where you're just, you know, shaking in your boots, I don't think. What does it mean to be the first black female pilot in a Cobra helicopter? In the Department of Defense's history, you're the first black female pilot. Well, first black female combat pilot and first black female pilot in the Marine Corps. Um, it was very humbling. You know, I couldn't believe it was, you know, the, almost the new, well, after a year 2000, the new millennium, and I'm doing a first. Uh, and I've actually received a good bit of flack about it sometimes because they say red, yellow, white, black, doesn't matter. You're doing the same job that uh, any other Marine pilot is doing. And I totally agree with that in one respect. But on the other side of it is Harvard, Yale, uh, any of your schools have been around a long time. But when that young man or woman graduates and they're the first generation graduate for that family and that family throws them a big party, they're proud of their son or daughter. So other women are proud of me. The other minority communities are proud of what I and other women have now done. So on one respect, I'm just a hardworking Marine going out there and doing it like all the other guys in my squadron. But on the other side of it, I've been blessed to be put in an opportunity to do not something special. I was just the first one to do it. And it was always very important to you, as Kirsten says in her book, not that you were first, but you never wanted to be average. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're here to be average. We've been given so many talents, and I believe everyone has a gift. And whatever those talents, gifts, that passion is, that it's incumbent upon me to give that back to the world and back to all my brothers and sisters here. Um, to not give back would be the most selfish act. To whom much is given, much is required. Rosie, tell us how you end up in combat in Iraq. My unit uh, wasn't deploying the whole unit. So I actually volunteered to go to a unit that was going to be uh, considered an ace. They were going to be the stand-up squadron uh, over there. And uh, so I volunteered to go and uh, fill a billet that was over there for uh, a Marine Gunnery Sergeant. Why? Because I've trained you know, my entire career, uh, I'm pistol quelled and I'm rifle quelled, just like any male is. And mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted the opportunity to do my job. And I chose to do that. You are wounded while you're there. Describe that experience. Um, well, there I was riding my bike. <laughs> uh, and, and that was one of the means that we got around. And I was just on my way to the armory and uh, a, an, a rocket, an indirect fired rocket, had landed and impacted about 100 meters away from me, and uh, I was hit and struck in the jaw by a piece of uh, shrapnel an inch and a half long. The doctor says to you, he's gonna airlift, airlift you to Baghdad. You say, doctor, just stitch me up, 
send me back to my troops. Once again, I ask, why? Because I'm, when I was wounded, Rosie wasn't wounded. Gunnery Sergeant Noel was. And it was my responsibility to those young Marines that were still there to return to them and set the example and uh, you know, lift, lift their morale. Let them know that you know, we can continue. You could have used that as a way out, I'm assuming. Oh yes, they, they really wanted to send me uh, to Germany and home. Kristen, back to you. After you sat down with the women as they came back and you interviewed them, what did you conclude about life for a woman living in the military, living in Iraq, living on a base? What is military life like for a woman? Well, it, it, it's tough over there. And talking about Iraq and in combat specifically, I mean, they're, they're definitely still the minority over there, and there are a lot of inconveniences. And they have to work. They, I still believe, and not all the women say this, but a lot of the women say that they have to work as hard, if not t as harder, than the men over there to prove themselves and to show that they're capable or more than capable of doing their job. And I, sh I show that in several instances in the book. Um, but they're just, they, they have to, they're constantly proving themselves, I think, um, over there and probably back here as well. Did you feel that pressure to prove yourself? Bernice? Um, well, yes. The pressure, if you will, to do a good job. And hopefully all Marines are feeling that pressure to do a good job. But is there a little bit added? Yes, um, because you are representing a lot smaller group. Just like if you're running and you see a female fall out of a run, it's different than when a guy falls out of the run because, you know, all the females. But so we... I always tried to make sure I held myself to a higher standard because I'm representing Gunny out there just like she's representing me and the females, you know, we're the band of sisters and we do have to stick together and doing a good job, that's of the utmost importance and I don't want anyone to see me doing otherwise. Did you feel that you needed to run faster? than the men or be better with a pistol than the men to be considered as good? Um, not so much that I had, to, I had to be better. It was if I was going to be a leader, you lead from the front. And if I wasn't running, you know, at the same time that it took for a man to run a PFT, a physical fitness test, then how could I tell him that he needs to do a certain thing if I can't do it myself? Okay, fair comment. Kristen, back to you. One of the big social issues is children left at home. So after all of your research, after all of the stories, what do you conclude about the impact on children left at home while mom is over fighting in Iraq? That's a tough one, the impact on the children. I, I, I can tell you the impact on the mothers because we always hear about the impact on the fathers and how tough it is for the fathers to go over mm -hmm. and the women would say and and people say oh to the women it's got to be really difficult for you to leave your children at home and there's no sugarcoating it they don't sugarcoat it and I don't sugarcoat it in the book it is really hard for women to leave their children but they would also say that it's hard for men to leave their children as well so you know to say this is what the women say throughout the book you know to say where um, you know it's harder for us to leave the children than the men, or, or you know, women shouldn't be in the military because they could be POWs. Well, what happens to a woman, is, a man, is just as bad as what happens to a female. Uh, am I getting this right? A female POW. You know, just the experiences are good and bad. They're shared. They're they're kind of equal. So um, for for people to just I don't know make those kind of comparisons, they, the women in the book just don't really buy it. They they think it's tough for all of them in combat. But as far as the, the, the children left behind, I think, I think it's going to take time to see. I mean, it's definitely hard for the children left behind. I mean, I know that. But um, how, they, how they do, how they survive down the road because of that experience, I think time will tell. Mm -hmm. But the gunny may be able to shed a little light on that. How did it impact you day to day, knowing you had children back here in the States? Um, it, when you're over there, um, you tend to, to not think, dwell on it so much. You're busy, you're doing your job, and it's important that you're focused on the, the mission at hand. Um, so you try not to, to you know, dwell on you know, missing your family or whatever. The, the internet, that helps to close the gap a little bit. You're able to you know, you know, email your children, and, and, and you, know, you can sometimes you know, get on a phone and, and talk to them a little bit. 
Um, but as far as the impact for my children, um, they've, they've only known the Marine Corps. So to them, it's, it's kind of, it's normal. It's, it's normal to them. I know that, you know, the, the general population, it's not normal that their mother wears combat boots, but to them, that's all they've known. And I'm sure, although they miss you, they're probably very, very proud of you. Oh, extremely. My, uh, my youngest son thinks it's cool that I've got a scar on my face. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, there's also, I think you might remember the story about Polly Montgomery, yes. who's a lieutenant colonel and a mom, and she talks about women and men on the battlefield and how they can, the moms and dads, and how they can help each other out. You know, um, like she talks about one of her pilots who's having a hard time leaving his children behind and how she can support him and, and actually get him ready to fly a mission by talking to him and empathizing with him. So I thought that was a good example of um, men and women, women helping each supporting other out and each supporting other. Supporting each other on the battlefield and getting, getting one another mission ready, using our strengths and weaknesses. Excellent comment. We need to take a break, so I'm going to ask our audience to stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Marine Captain Amy McGrath knew in the seventh grade that she wanted to be a fighter pilot. After graduating from the Naval Academy, she faced what is still a fairly unique and daunting challenge, learning how to fit into a typically all-male fighter squadron. As a weapon systems operator, or backseater, McGrath configured missiles and bombs for battle. Marcia Lilly dreamed of the ocean as a child. During her first deployment as a Navy aviation bosun's mate handler, Lilly worked on the water in one of the most hazardous environments in the world, the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, where helicopters and jets take off and land on a small, moving runway. From day one, I knew I took the right step. The Massachusetts School of Law is challenging, but you feel welcomed and supported at every turn. You're learning the professional skills you need to get hired. From professors with real-world experience. Trust me, that makes a huge difference. I now have a job I love, and the best part is, I'm not in debt. No LSAT is required. Teachers that make a difference at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law. Your future starts here. Ever hear the one about the frog? Put a frog in a pot of boiling water and it'll jump right out. But put a frog in a pot of cool water and slowly heat it up and that frog will boil. It's a lie. But as a metaphor for us and all that we go through as veterans, it's a story that rings true. We make excuses for how we feel. We push everything down. We tell ourselves the lie that it's easier to stay in that boiling water, to disconnect. And some days, maybe, it is. But you've never been interested in easy. Reaching out is hard. Do it anyway. You're not alone. You've got this. You are not a frog. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. Lance Corporal Kerry Blaze was a heavy equipment mechanic. Lance Corporal Priscilla Kispetic worked in maintenance. Both were stationed at Al-Assad Airfield. Both volunteered to go outside the wire to search Iraqi women and children. Both wound up in a firefight. Army medic Rochelle Spores was on her way to treat wounded Marines when her ambulance ran over a stack of IEDs. Spores was seriously wounded. Her passenger wasn't as fortunate. Welcome back. We are discussing the book, Band of Sisters. Kirsten, why do women join the military? What's your conclusion? Well, based on the women I interviewed, many joined for educational benefits. Some joined for financial security. 
Um, other join, others join for career opportunities, and many of these are the same reasons men join. One of the things I thought was interesting, and this may be true, this is probably true of men too, but a lot of the women who, who I interviewed um, had, had male figures in their family who were in the military, mm -hmm. a father, a grandfather, uncle, so I think um, those individuals were persuasive in, in those women joining. But it, it definitely resembled why the, why the men join. Vernice, why did you join the Marines? Well, I joined the Army previously just because uh, I thought it could help with my law enforcement career and becoming a police officer. Right. Now, joining the Marines, I actually wanted to do something that was a little tougher, so that automatically ruled out the Air Force and the Navy. So that's not a, you know, a play on the Army, but <laughs> you know, the Marines are just known as the ultimate, the, the elite, you know, the most physically fit. And on top of that, my grandfather was a Marine, um, and I have two dads. My dad, Clarence, was a Marine back in Vietnam, and my dad was a retired uh, uh, major in the Army. So it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to also be an officer and a pilot in the Marine Corps. So I knew at this time I was a police officer. I could always go back and be a cop, but I didn't always have the opportunity to be a United States Marine. So do you think men join for the same reason as women do? Um, so I would say for the most part. Now, there might be slightly more men that just want to join to shoot a gun or blow something up, but that's why I joined. I wanted to shoot a gun or blow something up. <laughs> so in the Army, I got to do that, and definitely as an attack helicopter pilot, I got to do that. Plus, I enjoyed my dream of being that police officer. So um, to me, it's all about living your dreams and living your passions. No regrets? None. Rosie. Um, I was actually going to school, uh, I was uh, in college, and I was working two jobs trying to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my friends, their parents were paying their way through college. And uh, I went to pay my rent one day, and the landlord's building that he, he owned also was the uh, building that housed uh, the, rec the recruiting station. And uh, I walked past there, and I thought, for just because of those uh, service members, um, and because of Marines, that we have the freedom to, you know, be pampered or do whatever we want to do. And, and my friends thought that, you know, roughing it was black and white TV. So because of, <laughs> because of the military, you know, we have those freedoms. And so I, that's why I joined. Talking about roughing it, there is a point that they need to or believe the military, the medical doctors feel you need a steel jaw. You need a plate anyway put in your jaw. You refuse, you say, you know, once again, stitch me up, you know, um, stay in here, I'll be back on the field, let me go back with my, my squadron. You see pa pain as a good thing. Yes, uh, when, when I was in, because I was airlifted, um, they you know, sedated me mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was uh, trying, I guess, to, to get off the operating table and return to my Marines. And Why doesn't that surprise us? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I was out, out, out in uh, Balad, they uh, discussed with me uh, sending me on to Germany to have a, a steel plate put in and my jaw wired shut. And uh, that wasn't an option for me because if I had gone to Germany, they'd have sent me home and I wasn't leaving my Marines. So um, I, I stuck to, to my guns on that one and, and, and insisted that I would be okay. Uh, and the doctor basically asked me, you know, if I, you know, would not eat anything solid for six weeks that I could go back. And uh, so I told them cheesecake is soft and Oreos get soft in milk. <laughs> and uh, they let me go back. And I actually really did eat Oreo cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one good thing. <laughs> Vernice, Kirsten in her book, talks about Cobra pilots and that whole branch of the military, so to speak, mm -hmm. saying that, quite frankly, it's very difficult that Cobras eat their young. Mm -hmm. They're not nice as a community. Should I go on, or is that the gist of it? That's the gist of it. <laughs> How'd you survive all that? Uh, the way all the rest of the guys survived it. Uh, we have to be anal, we have to be dedicated and uh, sticklers because when you go out there, lives are at stake. So if you're not tough back in the training environment, if you're not stressed or put under stress in the training environment, how are you gonna survive a wartime environment? So everything that I went through and any of the other guys went through was to prepare us for the ultim ultimate battle. And we actually ended up going uh, to Iraq when the conflict came up. So, you know, it's all for, for the ultimate reason why we're training is war. You don't go to Iraq once. 
you are deployed a second time. You come home, as I understand it from Kirsten's right. book, on your 30th birthday at 9 p.m. at night. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, first off, how did you feel when you got back home? Oh, I was elated, happy, it's yeah. ecstatic. You know, my mom, my dad's, uh, my brothers, my cousins, friends, you know, everybody was there, and it was awesome. You go back a second time. Kirsten describes your second deployment as more dangerous than your first. Tell us about the battlefield, Fallujah, if you will, in April of 2004. You were part of that. Yes, yes. Um, well, the difference is when we first went over there and, you know, the war and the road to Baghdad, we didn't get as much resistance as we're currently getting even right now. Uh, the insurgents are fighting back. They're using more surface-to-air missiles, more RPGs, where when we went over the first tour, we could fly directly over cities in support of our troops on the ground where the second time when I went back, we you know, avoided urban areas only when we specifically had to target um, just because they were shooting at us more and attacking more. Do you remember in the chapter where you highlight, Vernice, you talk about the battle in the mosque? Mm -hmm. Tell the audience <laughs> a little bit about that. Me? Tell yes. <laughs> Why don't you have Bernice tell him? Okay, Bernice, <laughs> you're up again. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. You'll do a better that's job. Okay. Well, uh, it was during the, the Battle of Najaf. It was August 10th. And we had just finished prosecuting a target in one of the buildings. It was a weapons cache. And we were transferred to another air controller. And we were told that they needed air support and they were pinned down by indirect fire. Uh, Captain Jason Grogan was in the back seat and uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Glenn Butler was controlling the section with the Huey. Well, he gave us tactical control because we had one more missile left on our aircraft, and it's, it's called a tow missile and it's wire guided. Well, the troops down on the ground didn't have any way to mark their position besides with a mirror, and they couldn't mark the target with smoke or anything because they didn't have anything to mark with. And again, they were pinned down and in a dire situation. So they were able to talk us onto the target, and I was able to sight it through the camera on the front of the helicopter. We circled around, came back, popped up, and now we're looking down. I've reacquired the target. How high up are you? Uh, about 800 feet. And we're in a dive headed towards the target, you know, getting everything in our reticle to shoot the missile. Well, it's set up. I'm looking down, pull the trigger. Nothing happened. And this is our last missile. So... If this one doesn't work, we don't have anything to put on target besides the rockets. And our guys, again, are in dire need because they're pinned down. I pull the trigger one more time because every second we're getting closer to this target. Missile shoots off, impacts the target. Jason follows up with six to eight missiles in the back seat. We pull off to the right, and I fire 20 millimeter, and the Huey covers our pull off as we leave the area. Well, that was our last missile. We're Winchester at this point. We go back to base. We found out later that day that they didn't receive any more incoming fire. And about four to five months later, I'm in the hospital. There's a young man in front of me. And I'm always talking to Marines anyway, just, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And he told me he was there for physical therapy. And he said he had some shrapnel in his leg. I was like, oh, so you're recently deployed. He said, yes, he was on the 11th Mew. I said, hey, I was on the 11th Mew. And I said, I was your air support. He's like, oh, wow, that's cool, you know. And I said, I fly Cobras. He's like, hey, I was on a mission. We were pinned down. We called for air support. Uh, Cobra and a Huey came in and destroyed the target. I was like, that sounds like a mission I was on. Mm -hmm. And we paired up the days, and it was the same mission. And I was all excited and like, yeah. And he was just looking at me very solemnly. And he said, ma'am, you saved my life. And you have no idea, you know, how that makes me or probably anybody else uh, marine wise that would feel to hear that because for me that's our sole purpose in life is to support those guys on the ground so to run into a marine you know and hear that it's it's you know wow because you usually don't get the feedback from the battlefield mm -hmm. you go out there you do your job you go back to base and you know so it's, it's pretty amazing yeah, that is Kirsten, are women prepared, in your opinion, for what they experience when they get onto the battlefield? Absolutely, which is um, interesting. But as we've talked about before, many of them have the same training that the men have. And 
when they're in a firefight, when they're in the Cobra cockpit, what, wherever they are, the training kicks in. The training's so good. In fact, in that first story, if you recall, it's two young Lance Corporals who are in a firefight, and one of the Lance Corporals says afterwards that she always complained about the training, but after that firefight, she was never con going to complain <laughs> about the training again because her training kicked in, and it saved her life. And that's, you know, it saves her life. It saves the ones on the battlefield. Um, so yeah, they they definitely. I don't. I don't think I've talked to anyone who says she wasn't prepared for. I mean, and and that they and they all say that they were where they needed to be, which I thought was great too. Because some enlisted before 9/11 and some afterwards, but they all felt like they were where they needed to be at the time they were there. Tell us about Marcia Little. That was one of my favorite. Marcia story. Lilly. Marcia. Marcia. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's um, aviation. Boatswain's mate handler on. She was on the USS Harry S. Truman, and then she went back again on the Eisenhower. And um, she's petite. She was, I think, under 100 pounds when she was out there on the aircraft carrier. And she worked on the flight deck, which, um, if you've never been on a flight deck, even on a nice day, if you're around 100 pounds, um, the wind out there in the ocean, even if there's a small breeze, I mean, I mean, it, it can definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, it's hard to grip your feet on that surface. The surface can be wet, it can be slick from oil, the fumes from the engines. It's, it's a hazardous environment on a good day it's, and, and on a quiet day it's a hazardous environment. Then you get the aircraft coming and going in wartime and it's really dangerous. And uh, she worked out there, she um, chalked and changed. She did a, there's a lot of jargon involved in the Navy. I mean, this was the hardest story to write when it came to jargon and just explaining everything. She operated what they call a Ouija board which is a small board that's representative of the flight deck. And it was her responsibility to show where all the aircraft were. It's a template. And, and they had all these little um, like puzzle pieces. Uh, and she had to move them around and show where each of the aircraft were located on the flight deck. And if she messed up and said that an aircraft was not getting ready, was not like parked, and, and that instead, if she said it wasn't parked and that instead if it was on the flight deck and an, and an aircraft was coming in and she didn't show that it was there, and then there could be a serious accident, you know, a collision or something. I mean, what she did was really important. And she was moving aircraft. I think, you know, she was a tractor, I think they call them tractor kings. She was in charge of moving aircraft around. And oh my gosh, you know, you back up a couple feet too, mu too far. And you're and off. That, and that aircraft and that tractor and Marcy are overboard. I mean, it's just. I mean, they, it's, um, it's a dangerous job, and the, the people out there are 19, 20, 21. And I think somebody says in the story, or, and I don't know if this went in the story, but I mean, a 19-year-old, you know, I'm not even sure you want to give them the keys to your car. <laughs> and they're out there on the flight deck moving these $50 million aircraft. It's incredible. What impressed me so much about her, and I loved your writing because there's one point where she makes some kind of a mistake. and. I will use this term loosely, but the supervisor starts screaming, you know, what dumb blank did X? Oh, yeah. And she pipes up, it was me. And he yells at her, well, what were you thinking? And she says, I wasn't. That's the point of it all. I wasn't thinking. And it, it really makes me appreciate how honest, you know, women can be. And then later she says, I think she says she was hungry. <laughs> and she just wanted to get I, off the That I can deck. relate to. <laughs> President Clinton signed the exclusion for women in combat. When did it really open up to women? Um, in, well, in military aviation, I think it was all in the mid-1990s, 94, 95. Are women in the military here to stay? Well, absolutely. Well, that's absolutely. what I want to hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We've been here. We're standing on the shoulders of many women that came before us. So. And in fact, other countries routinely mm -hmm. have used women. Right. Yes. What about in Iraq? Are there Iraqi women in the military? Yes. There's a picture of Yolanda Mayo. She's a public affairs chief. And she, uh, I don't know if this picture is in the book, but she's sitting among 
and I think it's just Iraqi women and they're in uniform and Yolanda was telling me that they risk their lives, their families, everything to serve their country and I don't know, I imagine they're not much more accepted by their government doing that mm -hmm. than they were a couple of years ago when this picture was taken but they are in the military but they are risking everything um, their family, the lives of their family members to do it so I don't imagine there are a whole lot of them doing it totally different question. How did the capture and the rescue of Jessica Lynch open up the public spotlight, if at all, to women in the military? Can I start? Yes, you may. <laughs> well, that was, and I haven't even mentioned that, but that was an impetus for me writing this book because here was this girl who got lost, in it, and I'm not saying it was her fault. I mean, I, I kind of, um, I think this was an issue with the Army, but but here was this woman who got lost, who was being held up as this hero. And I just thought there are so many women over there doing fabulous things who truly are heroes, who aren't being recognized. And it seemed to me that the, this, this one woman was enough for the Army, but she, it wasn't enough for me, because there are too many women over there risking their lives um, and making sacrifices, you know, family sacrifices, bodily parts, you know, who were being wounded and killed. Um, so that, that was, you talk about, um, your question had to do with how did that open up the, um, the recognition. Yeah, the public well, perception of women in the military. Well, well, one of the things I just want to say is that's one of the reasons why I wrote, that bo wrote this book. So hopefully it will really, this book will open up the eyes and show that, that Jessica Lynch was not the only female over there and, and all the wonderful things they're doing. What was your reaction to the media's coverage of that? Well, ironically, I was in the advanced course. That's a, a, a formal school that they send uh, Marine gunnery sergeants to, and I was the only female in the class. So <laughs> when that happened, every, everybody wanted to know my opinion on it. And it was simple. There's no difference to me for her getting wounded and captured as would be any male getting wounded or captured, and I didn't agree that, that and not her fault, she didn't ask for the media hype, mm -hmm. but I, I, I was very, very disappointed in the, the, the handling of the hype because, again, uh, she, she, she's, she makes the same, she was making the same sacrifice, if you will, that a man is, yet they made such a big deal about it. And, you know, I, financially she uh, recouped a little from that. We have, you know, our male counterparts that, that are wounded. And uh, also, ironically, a friend of mine had been killed uh, during that same time that I was at the advanced course. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I mean, it, it, it had that extra little personal mm -hmm. connotation to it that it frustrated me because I knew that he had a young son that was like five or six years old. It's a little difficult of a question when you think about it sometimes because women are paying the same price as the men. Should there be more hype for a woman uh, dying or being wounded over there? In a realistic world, no, it's all the same thing. But whenever you look at uh, the beginning of something, people are going to just give it more attention. Like when the first female combat pilot died, uh, and this is back, I think, in the first Gulf War flying the jet, you know, it was really blown up. But back when, you know, World War II, and you had the WASP, and you had the Tuskegee Airmen, and, each time, you know, you've gone through an evolutionary cycle when it comes to the military, it's been in the media. Um, today, we're much more media-centric than we've ever been when it comes to the military and war and being overseas. So it's just exponentially, you know, mm -hmm. blown up. So each time we've gone through something like this in our history, it's hit the media, whether it was male or female, whether it was the black Marines or the women flying the aircraft and giving their lives, because many women perished, um, just transporting aircraft for the men over there to fly. So should it be blown out of proportion or uh, given more of a light? Maybe, maybe not. It's a uh, part of our history that's always going to be there. If it wasn't talked about, then people would say, why didn't we know more about this? For women like me, 
we didn't even know really that women were serving in these kind of roles in Iraq. So the simple exposure of it perhaps could be argued to be a good thing. But we need to pray, take a break so I get the last word on that and we'll be back <laughs> in just a moment. Please stay tuned. Strange things happen in wartime, like asking a C-141 pilot to take command of a C-130 squadron. When Lieutenant Colonel Polly Montgomery took over the 41st Airlift Squadron, she became the first female commander of a combat squadron in the Air Force. In a short period of time, she had to get acquainted with not only her new aircraft, but also her male-dominated squadron. Fortunately, she's a quick learner with keen instincts. Sergeant Angela Jarbo always liked doing what the boys did. As an adult, that translated into choosing a career as a truck driver for the Army. While returning from a mission, a van rigged with bombs and parked along the side of the road exploded just as Jarbo's truck drove up beside it. Military life can have its challenges, but sometimes veteran life brings more. As America's veterans face challenges, DAV is there. I'm Greg Gadsden, Army veteran. DAV helps veterans and their families get the benefits they've earned. Today, I'm an entrepreneur, photographer, and public speaker, and I never tire of standing tall. With the right support, more veterans can reach victories, great and small. My victory is just being the best that I can be. Support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV.org. Earning your law degree shouldn't burden you with overwhelming debt. At Massachusetts School of Law in Andover, we believe it should be affordable, achievable, and yes, even an enjoyable first step to your successful career. We believe in an atmosphere of support, flexible class scheduling, and hiring professors with real-world experience, ensuring you leave law school with the professional skills you need. We are the most affordable law school in New England, and we believe in you. The Massachusetts School of Law. Your future starts here. Live from an undisclosed location in Iraq is Marine Gunnery Sergeant Yolanda Mayo. In Iraq, this wife and mom reported on the war from the safe zone in Baghdad, or as she affectionately called it, the impact zone. Mayday, 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 White Wolf 06, we're going down, a female voice said into the headset of her helmet. Moments before, a Kiowa helicopter flown by Army Captain Robin Brown and her co-pilot had taken a hit from a shoulder-fired heat-seeking missile. The pilots and their aircraft dropped quickly to the ground. Welcome back. We are discussing the new book, Band of Sisters. Rosie, let me begin this segment with you. Did the men accept you with open arms as a part of the squadron? Um, to a certain extent, um, I'd, I'd have to say yes, because I'm, I'm a professional and I go out there and I set the example and, you know, I work hard and uh, I, I, I'm a good leader to them. And I think that that, you know, is key. Um, I'm rifle qualled, I'm pistol qualled, and uh, I do the same things that they do. Did they accept you with open arms? Uh, my answer would have to be no. And, uh, <laughs> but that's okay, because I wasn't going there you know, to be accepted. I was going there to do a job. Now, were there um, guys that took me under their wing and helped me out? Absolutely. But were there some that didn't want me there? Absolutely. Uh, I was just talking to my bud yesterday, as a matter of fact. She's a Huey pilot, and we served together in Iraq both times. And uh, you know, I've, I've become a motivational speaker now. And there was a segment on uh, CNN, and she got a call about it. And one of the guys said, "Well, you know, I'm not a big V fan, but <laughs> blah blah blah." <laughs> and I'm saying, "Wow, after all these years, because it's been about five years now," I said, "What did I ever do for them not to accept me in certain uh, instances?" And you know, we all have our trials and things that we go through. I didn't always do everything right. And I tried to do the best that I could. But um, that's all you can do. You know, you can only do the best that you can. And 
like I said, try to bring everybody back safe and be the consummate professional. But when you do fall, it's not about when and if, it's how you get back up. So I always try to get back up, get on my feet and do the right thing. Cobra pilots have to study all the time. Why is that so? Because there's always something more to learn. And if you've learned it, then you need to review it and you need to reinforce it. Just like the Marine that said she complained about the training. And after being in that mm -hmm. firefight, she was glad for that training. Uh, you will never know everything that's in that tactical manual. And since you don't, you need to be trying to figure out what it is. Because when the metal meets the road, you don't have time to look in that tack man, and that's sure for tactical manual to say, okay, what button do I need to push? What flip do I need to, to turn? You have to know it. It has to be muscle memory. It has to be second nature. And again, that goes back to why they eat their young and why we're so anal, because you have to be, because you have to know what you, you're doing when the time comes. And as you said in the book, the enemy, the enemy is studying you, and you yeah. have to, you know, the, they're trying to outsmart the pilots, the aviators, so the aviators have to always be one step ahead of them. I would imagine that part of the motivation is you don't want to die. I mean, that would be for me. I would well, study every time, every minute, okay? <laughs> you would think, but no, the real motivation is Good. I want to keep those guys mm -hmm. from dying. That's the real motivation. If I die in the process, I volunteer to do that, but I want to make sure I'm doing my job if I'm going down. Kirsten, do you conclude that women warriors are different than men or are they the same really? So I think they're very, I think they're the same. And you know, one of the challenges or, or concerns with this book is that I wanted to put them in the spotlight so that they would stand out and people would see what they're doing now. Not so much because they're different, but because this is new, this is a first. Um, but really, their training so much, their training is so much the same. And I just, I think, um, I really think that they're very similar to the men. I just, I found more simila similarities than differences. I mean, there were inconveniences, things they had to adapt to, you know, the showers and mm -hmm. the restrooms and stuff like that. But that's minor stuff. But I think when it comes to the battlefield and war and combat and stuff, I think they're very similar to their male counterparts. Rosie, what was the lowest point in your deployment? Uh, my lowest point when I got my uh, personal effects bag when I was sitting in a hospital bed in Balad. And it occurred to me that I was almost taken away from my uh, two children. Mm -hmm. It was really a very... Um, humbling experience um, because you know there are so many other individuals that have been wounded or or killed and you know what made you know and I, I I guess it goes back to that faith thing I carried an angel in my pocket and there's just there's plans for me and uh, so by the grace of God uh, I survived and uh, that but that was probably the lowest point was realizing I was almost taken away from my children Bernice how about for you uh, it's kind of different. My lowest point was when I failed the tactics test. We were a couple months from coming home. It was during the first deployment and you talked about the pressure earlier and Cobras eat their young and uh, always having to do that good job. Well, the last thing you want to do when you're a Cobra pilot is fail any kind of test, let alone a tactics test. So when that happened, I felt like I'd let uh, my community down, women down, you know, kind of like falling out of that run, or the Marine Corps down, uh, myself down, and most of all those guys in the squadron down, because I didn't show the full potential of what I could do. So that was uh, actually the one regret that I had for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you try to do the things you can to come back. Sometimes when you're in that hole, it is just really, you know, hard to get back out. Now it's not a regret of mine because of where I am in my life and what I'm doing. Um, and some, Les Brown says you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. And many times when we're going through things and we're out there and we're on that deployment and we're saying why, you know, why did I get hit with a piece of shrapnel riding a bike? But there's a purpose in everything that we do and we're being prepared for the greater good. So you just have to have faith and know that uh, it's going to be okay. So even though that was Honestly, that was the lowest point for me. Mm -hmm. um, it has made me the woman I am today. What was the highest point in your deployment? Uh, probably 
8.59, right before getting off the bus, because we're technically still on deployment until you're released, uh, seeing my mom and dad and family through that window uh, coming back. But when a true deployment stuff, uh, just being out there, flying across the desert, seeing the sunset, and knowing I was really doing something that made a difference. Rosie, the highest point in your deployment? Um, I think uh, receiving my Purple Heart in front of my Marines. Describe the killing aspect of war. Bernice, let's start with you. What do you mean when you say describe? How do you feel when you're throwing a grenade or you're firing and you know that the recipient is going to die as a result? Does that worry you? Does it trouble you? Um, Could you look someone in the eye and pull the trigger without worrying about his children or her children at home? Well, if they're looking one of my Marines in the eye getting ready to pull that trigger, absolutely. Or if they're trying to kill me, you know, yeah, there's no question. Is death and dying, a, you know, a pretty thing? No. Is that something that really in our society we kind of talk around? You know, yes, sometimes it is, especially when you're talking about women on the front lines pulling the trigger. But if it's between someone who is trying to kill me and my Marines, you know, there's really no question of what has to be done. And when you're doing that, again, it's not the emotional factor for me. It's I'm out there doing a job. When you take your mind off of the mission and you start thinking about the emotional side of the house or the other things, lives are at stake. Are your experiences and your feelings the same? Well, I was never really given the opportunity to, to shoot at an insurgent, but by golly, knowing that I was hit by an indirect fire rocket and there was nobody around to retaliate against, given the opportunity, absolutely. What, if, what would it be like, and Kirsten, you probably are the best one to answer this question, for a woman to get in a Humvee to go out to a battlefield when there's a sniper shooting at her, and she has children back here in the United States? I know, I'm loading up the question, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a law class, tell me. I know, I, know. I, I just think, we may sound like a broken record here, but you know, it's no different from the guy going out there and they're just not thinking about the children. If they're thinking about the children, they don't belong in the battlefield. I mean, when they're going out on a mission, they're thinking about that mission. They're not thinking about the children. When they go to bed at night, they may be thinking about the children. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, when they're working, they're focused. Sure. I mean, I've just heard that all the way through. And um, the nurse in here, uh, she's not necessarily in direct fire, but um, she was definitely in danger. And she had children, but she was working all the time, I mean, 24-7. And when she went to bed at night, she'd pull out her pictures and look at her children's pictures and think about them. But, uh, you know, she's treating Marines, and she's treating wounded Marines all day. She's not thinking about her children, although some of them did when, when like if, if, you're old, if you're in your 40s and you have an 18-year-old son and at back home, Nisa Williams was saying this, the anesthesiologist, and there's a wounded 18-year-old Marine on the bed, on the, on the um, litter or something, then she's thinking about her son back home. But that's, that's a medical thing. That's not somebody in a Humvee going on a convoy. But I just, I feel like what, they, what they've been saying supports this, just that they're, they're really mission ready and focused. And if they're thinking about their children, that's a problem. What did your experience in the military teach you that will help you the rest of your life? And I'll open it up to either one of you. Well, I think um, for me personally, that um, you have to earn everything that you get. Nothing should be given. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, go through life, you, you are going to have to make sacrifice. And uh, I think earning it is, is definitely makes me feel that I've done my part. When I go to bed at night, I know that I've done my, my part. Bernice? I think it would uh, it reinforce self-sacrifice, really, because when you're out there, it's not about you, it's about the team. And the Marine Corps helped me realize what my true passion is, and that's reaching out to uh, our society, especially our youth. Like I said, I'm transitioning, getting out, and doing the motivational speaking thing. And when kids ask me, you know, what was it like to be that pilot, to be the first, or why did I want to be a police officer, I can share the legacy that our 
my grandparents and my great grandparents and just society has given us. Um, it's a blessing to even be able to go to Iraq and fly in support and security for my, my country. So just being able to share that with the next generations coming up, um, the Marine Corps gave me that. Before we run out of time, I know my audience will want to know what's next for the three of you. What books are in your mind? Any? Oh, yeah. <laughs> De definitely. The list goes on and on, right? Yeah, I, I would definitely like to build on this book. Uh, you know, this book, we talk about first and good first and bad first. I mean, you know, you talk about women and stuff. And this, I think this was a, a good first book about women in combat. I think there are others out there. And I would like to build on this. I'm not exactly sure how, mm -hmm. but, but I think we need more female heroes. Um, fewer Paris Hiltons and more Vernice Armors and Gunnery Sergeant Rosie Noels. Excellent comment. What's next for you? I think I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it'll be exclusively professional speaking now and community outreach. Very nice. How about you? Um, I've kind of got the eye on the, on the ball for retiring in a year. Um, you know, served, gave the Marine Corps 20. Uh, my children made sacrifice while I was uh, doing deployments and, and whatnot. And uh, so I'm going to get out of the Marine Corps and, and, and be a mom. And, you know, obviously, there, you know, I haven't decided what I want to be when I grow up. So, uh, <laughs> but there's a career out there for me, and I'm certain I can do that. How old are your children? Um, my, uh, I have two boys, uh, 15 and 12. Mm -hmm. And they survived quite well? Um, yes. Yes, I'd like to say that you know their grandmother survived too because she took care of them while I was in Iraq. <laughs> but uh, I joke with her though: be careful what you wish on your children. And uh... Kirsten, tell us about some of the other women in the book, some of the other stories. Sure. Well, I've mentioned the first one, which is um, the two lance corporals who were in the firefight, and and they were actually ones in maintenance and ones a mechanic, I believe. And they were working in an, on an air base, and the infantry needed some women to come out with to go out with them and help them search the women and children when they went house to house. And these two women volunteered and ended up in a firefight. And then there's um, another lance corporal, Chrissy DiCaprio, who was an MP, and she would she provided security on these convoys, and she'd be in the first or second vehicle, and and she's pretty amazing and tough. She's about five feet tall, a hundred pounds, and she's wielding that 50 cal. And um, you know, you, you just don't want to be on the other end of that 50 cal, because <laughs> she's really tough. And nobody was getting close to her convoy. I would like to be on her convoy if, if I was in Iraq. Um, and then I've got some medical people um, and a couple wounded women. Um, there's, a, there's a medic in the story, an army medic, who was on her way to rescue three Marines and she was seriously wounded. Mm -hmm. And there's an army truck driver who was on a convoy when she was seriously wounded. And like I mentioned the nurse, and I have four female aviators in the book, and they're all first. Because Let me ask you in the remaining few minutes, what advice do you give to little girls in the audience that are watching this with mom and dad and say, you know what, I want to do what she's doing? Well, I, your advice? I would say that, that, you know, just like I was told, you can do whatever you want to do. If you put your mind to it and you've got the determination, then, then you need to do that. Follow, follow your heart and, and, and you'll, you'll find the right path. And I think that if this is what they want to do, you know, we're, we're ready for them and, and we'll be willing to train them to do that. Uh, passion, purpose, poli passion, purpose, positive steps. You have to follow your dreams. If you do what average people do, you'll have what average people have. I don't want to be average, do you? <laughs> and if they want to do what I'm doing, they could check out my website at verniceArmor.com because I'd be happy to share anything and everything with them, and that's what I'm here for. Wonderful. And if they want to be a writer? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they can be a writer. <laughs> Say one final yes, thing. you may. Don't forget about the troops out there because they're out there doing it every single day and you might want to turn that TV off because you're tired of hearing about it. But remember, uh, we still have men and women out there that are putting their lives on the line every day. Thank you panel Thank you. for coming today. We appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Take care of yourselves to our viewing audience. Until next time, be well and thanks.